Lord, we thank you so much once again for this day that you have given us. And Lord, as Elizabeth said, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak through me, that I will not say anything that is based on my own understanding, but rather all things come from God, by God, to his children. Thank you, Lord, to allow me to be your messenger for this morning. May this lesson be something we can apply in our lives and start to understand why we suffer. We thank you, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus, our living Savior. Amen. Now, I didn't tell you last week that we're going to start off with a test. Uh-oh. <laughs> the simple test last week, and by the way, the name of this message is Why God Allows Sickness. Once again, Why God Allows Sickness, Part 2. Now, last week, we went over where God inflicted sickness as a form of punishment. A quick test. Which king was it that was afflicted with leprosy? Nope. Nope. Oh. It comes between the alphabet of T and V. What letters between T and V? You. Uzziah. Thank you. Uzziah. That's right. Uzziah was inflicted with leprosy because he did not honor God. He had an instrument in his hand and he got angry at the altar and God punished him. Then, who was it that was forced to eat grass like the animals? Everyone got that one. Nebuchadnezzar. Why did God do that? Because God, even through the prophet, warned Nebuchadnezzar for 12 months to change his ways, to not be proud, to not try and claim everything for him. He didn't listen. So until he turned his eyes to God, he was forced to eat grass like the animals. Now, what was the name of the king, or oh, another king, who was so proud so bold that claimed glory for himself rather than God, and he was eaten by worms. What? Huh? That's right. That was the first one that Consolata said as well. King Herod. Look at that. They all have something in common. They were proud. They were arrogant. They were angry. Most importantly, they did not honor God but themselves. These are times where God did punish with sickness. Now, we also come to someone else that we spoke about last week. Who was that? I'll give you a hint. Thorn. Paul, thank you. That's right. Now, here's something completely different where we learn so much. How many times did Paul pray for God to remove the thorn? That's right, three times. But here's the thing is, we thought it was only one thorn until last week, right? And we found out he had many thorns. His eyesight, his speech, his thinking, his depression. But he still counted it all glory. So, based on what we learned last week, and if you missed it, by the way, especially those of you watching online, if you missed last week, Joshua has actually uploaded it to uh, Britannia Baptist YouTube. You can watch it from last week. And once again, it's called God, Why God Allows Sickness. So based on last week, remember I said we'll start off today with three lessons. So we pull out three lessons from last week. The first lesson is humility. And the best way to describe humility is not putting yourself above others. This is also known as being humble. Now, I want to start off going over some verses, some very important verses from the book of Colossians. I myself love the book of Colossians. Now, Colossians itself was written to correct the church. Paul was the author of this book. 
But now that we know things a little bit differently, he wrote this specifically to the church in Colossae. But who is the church? Thank you, Alan. You heard that very strongly. We are the church. So therefore, even though this was written in 60 AD, that's Ano Domini, Christ era, 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago, it applies to us today. Isn't that amazing? God's word written that long ago applies to us right now, right here, and to the future. That's right. It was written to correct God's church, us. Now, the thing I love about Colossians, if you ever read it, chapter 1 and chapter 2 is all about what Jesus did. And chapters 3 and chapters 4 is what we are supposed to do as Christians. So remember that, please. Colossians 1 and 2, what Jesus did, chapters 3 and 4 is what we are supposed to do as Christians. What I want to start off is what we are not supposed to do, what we are supposed to avoid as Christians. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Once again, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. And then move ahead to verse number 8. Verse number 8, chapter 3 of Colossians. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. That's pretty straightforward. Even for Christians, that can be a challenge. That's what we are not supposed to do. But now let's move ahead to verse number 12. Verse number 12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Boy, can we do all of that? Nobody's saying yes. <laughs> That's a challenge, isn't it? Here, Paul offers five ways of life that Christians ought to follow. In addition, he prefaces his list by referring to believers in three different names. In that verse 12, the first name, they are God's chosen ones. God selected or elected them, us, to be part of his family. The second name he calls us, we are holy, which means we are set aside, we are set apart. This is due to God's work in us. Get this right, God's work in us, not our own doing. We've got to remember that. That's a problem the kings had. They claimed it as their own doing and not as God's work. The third name we are called in chapter, sorry, in verse 12. We are beloved. One verse that talks about this, John 3.16. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So we are beloved. Now, the first pos positive practice Paul gives when we look at that list, remember, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I am going to describe each one. First one is a compassionate heart. This is in response to God and to others, which is filled with love and concern rather than selfishness. That's right. Take away that selfish attitude in our heart and when we start doing for others, we are compassionate. Second 
It mentions kindness. There's a Greek word for this. Chrestoteta. C-H-R-E-S-T-O-T-E-T-A. Which can also be translated as moral goodness or integrity. This term refers to how a person should treat others. And thirdly, believers are to live in humility. It's a trait that is valued by God throughout the Bible. A great verse for this is James chapter 4, verse 6. That is James chapter 4, verse 6. Six. I love this. I see everybody opening their Bibles and looking through to get there. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. That speaks for itself, doesn't it? The gospel requires people to admit. That's right. It, it says that we must admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior. That's right. As believers, we should recognize God's supremacy in our lives and how limited we are in comparison. That's right. We're not a God. There are many that teach that each individual person is their own individual God. No, we can never be like God. We can never even come close to God. Humility is also important so that we don't act arrogantly, that we don't act unfairly towards other people. That's a big call to order, isn't it? Not to be arrogant to others. And that, once again, comes back to what the kings did. They were bold to God and they were arrogant to others. Now the fourth one in verse 12 mentions meekness. This is from the Greek word prateta. P-R-A-U-T-E-T-A. This is not an attitude of fear or the suggestions that Christians ought to be timid. To be timid means to be easily frightened. Rather, it refers to gentleness instead of a hard-hearted response to others. Wow. Can we be that? Can we be gentle to others? In thought, in word, in deed? A meek person is one who controls their strength and power. Get this. Controls their strength and power rather than abusing it. Wow. Our fifth one in verse 12 is patience. Patience from believers. All Christians have patience, right? Uh-oh, it's too quiet. Doctors have patience, but do we have patience? That's right. This and other traits in this verse closely reflect a very, very important verse in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Those of you who went during COVID lockdown on the Wednesdays, I did a complete series on every single one of these. Do you remember that at all? Remember Galatians 5, 22, 23? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Boy, if we could be all of those, I'll tell you. Would we be the perfect example of a Christian here on earth, but still not be anywhere near as close as Jesus when he was here on earth? So as you have seen, lesson one tells us that humility in his servants, us, is so amazingly important to God. That's right. It's basically number one to God, humility. 
Our second lesson that we learned from last week, God is willing to allow Satan a limited level of power. Remember that, okay? Limited level of power to create helpful weakness in us, in his children. Doesn't that sound weird? So we can actually thank Satan for trying to make us weaker. As Paul shows, and I'm going to be putting lesson two and lesson three together, the reason why is because the verses that I will read will explain everything. But God's power is made perfect in our weakness, not in our strength. Remember that, okay? In our weakness, not in our strength. And the third lesson that we learned, or we should learn, is spiritual strength is no guarantee of health. It is no guarantee of wealth. It is no guarantee of prosperity. Let us now look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll allow you to get there to find it, then I'll tell you which verses. So that is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. We know this one. This is what Paul said, verses 8 and 9. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, let us get this straight. When illness does come, and it will for each one of us, it may not be the result of God's direct intervention in our lives. That's right. Not all things come from God. Not all things are orchestrated by God. But it is rather the result of a fallen world, our fallen bodies, our poor health. This is a hard one for us. Our lifestyle choices. I suffer from a number of different neurological disorders because of my ignorance when I was younger. When we're young, we think we're invincible, right? Well, I abused it. I took drugs, many different types of drugs. I drank heavily. I lived a life where I thought I was invincible, and I'm paying for it now. Because part of what I have is my own ignorance and my own fault. And that's right. I will not blame anyone for this other than myself. But... Although there are scriptural indicators that God wants us to be in good health, we must understand this. Is our body not the temple of God? 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, just before Revelations, the third book of John, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. See, God wants nothing but the best for us. Now, what we must realize is all sickness, I didn't say some, all sickness and diseases are allowed by God for his purposes, whether we understand it or not. And you know what? We've seen some people that are really suffering, right? And some people, I've heard them, especially non-believers. I've heard it from believers as well. Well, how can they suffer so much? Isn't he a loving God? Well, I'm going to explain how this works very soon. So that you will understand that God is, not, is a loving God. And that there is a reason for everything. Sickness is certainly the result also, like I said before, in the fall of man into sin. But you've got to understand this. God is in control. That's right. 
and he does indeed determine how far evil can go. Remember I said that? That God allows Satan to inflict us, but only limited. Who is a perfect example of that? Job, that's right. Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. Please write this down. I encourage you to read it to understand that even though God allowed Satan to inflict him, God put rules on Satan. That's right. Satan was not allowed to exceed those boundaries that God told him. He said, you can do whatever you want to him, but you may not kill him. Now, this is where some people get confused. Some people think that God has given Satan all power. Have you ever heard the word omnipotent? Omnipotent means all power. There's only one who has all power, God. That's right. Over 50 times in the Bible, it tells us that God is omnipotent. And it is amazing to see how his sovereignty unites with the choices we make. God loves us whether we are bad or good in our choices. Why? Because God works it out for his perfect plan. That's right. It's not us. We don't sit there and say, okay, God, I'm praying, you be quiet and you listen to me. Believe it or not, some people take that. They, they, they force God's hand. How many times have we heard it said in many different churches and places? Oh no, I command you right now that God is going to heal you, that God is going to give you. Who are we to tell God what to do? Right? Who are we to tell God what to do, how to do it, and when to do it? And the trouble is, we do. Who's guilty that when you pray, and you say a beautiful prayer from your heart, and then you say, I want it now. You don't say it out loud, but he knows you're thinking it, right? Remember it says patience? This is not in here, but do we have patience? Why is it when we pray, we want it all now? I guess we haven't learned that word yet, right? So this is what gets on to one of the most amazing verses in the whole Bible. Romans 8. Bingo. Does anybody have a prize for Jacqueline? <laughs> that was perfect, Jacqueline. That's right. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. I am emphasizing very strongly each word at a time because we have to remember this. Who have been called according to his purpose. That's right. You, you're still right with that one, Consolata, because different Bible versions have different words. Purpose, will, so you're right. I read from the NIV, New International Version. Now, please allow me to explain this verse. Here again, we find a verse which is extremely popular, often misapplied, and even controversial. What that means is this verse itself has caused so many arguments and disagreements on its meaning. Now, despite its incredibly comforting message, some Christians <clears throat> sorry, have an awkward relationship with this verse. That's right. That is in no small part due to how easy it is to take this verse out of its context or its meaning. Right? We use it for different meanings. What we are doing is we are stripping these words of their meaning. And when we do that, we destroy the very essence of what this scripture is saying. It is possible to interpret the verse correctly and still misuse and dismiss the genuine pain and suffering of another person. Paul himself in this verse has been describing the life of Christians on the side of heaven 
as one of groaning as we long to escape the suffering of this life. Isn't that true? Do we groan and moan about our life? We do, right? What we should be looking forward to is life with God. God, not just with God, but God in person. Right? There's a difference. Okay. Right here. It's the Bible. 66 books about God. Right? So we read about God of the Bible. But what happens when, like for example, you're online, and I pray that you are also grabbing your Bible and not just saying, oh, it's nice. No, you're opening it. Do you know why? Then you get to know the God in the Bible. Not of the Bible, but in the Bible. Do we do this in our lives? Do we take time to allow God to be in us? And this is what's very important. Wow. Sorry, I get a little bit excited sometimes. But we have to, right? This is God's word. Paul is so powerful in his words. Remember we described last week that he was given a glimpse of heaven? Can you imagine if we were given a glimpse of heaven? What would we be like coming back here? First of all, would we want to come back? That's right, we wouldn't. But coming back, we still have to continue to suffer. But we wouldn't moan and groan. We would wait in the sure hope. Remember what we've been promised? That day of our resurrected bodies. Who, who's looking forward to that? No more pain. No more suffering. No more arthritis. No nerve pains. I'll have a set of teeth again. <laughs> oh. Wow, my one pack would be gone. <coughs> Isn't it true? See, we talk about what, they, what is going to be in the future, and we are giggling, we are laughing. All of a sudden, we are full of joy. No more blindness. I can take these glasses off. I can't see, but we'll be able to see. We'll be able to see with pure eyes, not with earthly eyes. And this is what this is talking about. That's why we can take Romans 8.28 out of context, because we're trying to understand it with earthly minds. But think about that. Wow, our resurrected bodies. But sorry, we've got to come back to earth. Oh no, look at it. Ancelotta's smile is gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> what about all the hard things that come along while we are waiting? Right? Is anyone in here or watching online? Feel free to answer. Is anyone here without trouble? Is anyone here without pain? Oh, is anyone happy? Do I hear a yes? No. no. Uh oh. <laughs> we got to change that, right? We have to change that. We look at this verse, what Paul is actually saying here is giving us a promise of comfort in the future. Who wants comfort in the future? Oh, yes. This is a promise from God, and I say this many times. God never breaks his promise. But let us now break down Romans 8, 28 to what it really says. And for those of you that are watching now or in the future, if you're a non-believer, I've got bad news for you. The starting of Romans 8.28 says, for those who love God. That's right. And for those of you that are non-believers, you don't love God because you rejected his son, Jesus. And then it says, those who are called according to his will. In short, that means us, Christians. Those of us who are saved. Why? Because then we can place our trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're watching this right now, even if it's in the future, it would be right now for you. If you don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, 
That's right, I'm looking at you right now. Read John 3.16 again, please. Read John 3.16. And this is to you. I said it already, I'll say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That means that if you accept Jesus Christ, you will not experience that second death. The second death is eternal separation from God. You will be thrown into hell. I've heard so many people say, oh, it doesn't sound so bad. Are you going to say that when you're there? Remember, even you that are non-believers are going to get that new resurrected body. That body will never die. So for eternity, you will feel pain, burning, anguish. And guess what? There's no water fountain in hell. You will get no relief. Imagine all your fears, all your fears that you have, whether it's snakes or whatever the case may be, all those fears will be lived out every single moment in hell. That's why they call it hell. So I'm pleading to you, and I've heard so many say, oh, I'll think about it. You cannot afford to think about it because we don't know when God's going to call us back. Right? We don't know when our last second. I could be here one second saying this, next second, I'm gone. We don't know when God's going to call us. We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. Right now it would be great. <laughs> but when he does come back, are you ready? John 14, 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one shall come to the Father unless through me, which is through Jesus Christ. There are many churches and many religions that don't teach this. You go to a man and they tell you what to say to be forgiven. You can only be forgiven by Jesus Christ, by accepting him, by asking for forgiveness, by asking Jesus into your heart. The greatest gift of all, and it's free. I am pleading to you that are watching that don't have Jesus. Don't wait. You cannot afford to wait. I do not want to see you in hell. Does any of us want to see anybody in hell? This is what's going to happen. This is, this is what it describes in Romans 8, 28. But no matter how our feelings on a given day, because we know each day is different, loving God is part of what it means to live in Christ. That's who we are. Amen? We are Christians who accepted Jesus Christ, so we, have, we must love God. We know there are days that we are angry at God, but being angry doesn't mean you don't love him. Out of all people, I said people. That's right, God is a person. Jesus is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. They are real. It says that you can get angry, but they will always forgive you and love you when you ask. Each of us is also called to fulfill God's purpose. Isn't that hard? And like I said at the start, this particular verse, Romans 8, 28, does not apply to non-Christians. But I've told you how you can change that. And please, change it. If you're not sure how, you're watching, you know how to get to our website, BritanniaBaptistChurch.ca. Pop us a message, please. Ask us, how can I become a Christian? Do you know why? Because those who reject God do not express love for God by coming to Jesus in faith. Because, like I said, those who die without Christ will not have worked things out for the better. And you will reject the perfect opportunity to take advantage of this promise. It says, do not take advantage of others. But in a case like this, I encourage you to take advantage of Jesus. That's right. Use him. Because you know what? He is sitting there waiting for you. That's right. He's waiting there for you. 
When I was in jail on my third time, it was close to what, five years in jail, I didn't know that Jesus was there waiting for me. He was ready to use my weakness for his strength. Me, a big tough guy in jail, thousands of other people in there for the same reasons. And here is me with a nickname, Bible Thumper. You know, to how well that goes over in jail. But that's what he tells us to do. This book of Colossians is so loving. Paul wrote it whilst he was in jail. Wow. John 3, verse 36. The fourth book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Now, what is this promise? That for those who are saved, all things, not some, all things will indeed work together for good. And I've heard so many people say, well, how can you say a child being killed or dying is not good? It's not good. It's terrible. They don't understand. Once again, this was not orchestrated by God. And they say, how does God allow it? There's many things that happen that God allows. Remember, God didn't orchestrate it. Man did. There is evil in this world that we have to accept. We have no choice, right? But we can do something about it. Amen? All things should be taken to mean each and every circumstance that we will experience. That's right. That includes pain. That includes suffering. I know you're saying, can I opt out? <laughs> That's right. We have to. And when it says work or work together, we must understand in light of God taking action in this world. Many of us think that God does not listen, that God does not work in this world. Well, he does. He is the one who causes all things to work together. Or maybe I could put it in another way. It works in and through all circumstances toward a specific, sorry, a specific end. And what is the end? Good. The end of all of this is good. Why? Because anything that God does is good. Remember the song? Elizabeth was starting to state it before they singing that God is good. God is good. God is great. God is amazing. Good is just a little description. Right? But it's a song, right? God is good all the time. In this. God is good all the time? Wow. What's a great song? all the time. The trouble is we don't believe it. But the word good does not necessarily mean happy. The word good doesn't mean painless. The word good does not mean financially successful. It doesn't mean our idea of the best possible outcome on any given day. God's ultimate good for us is to glorify him for eternity. Just write that down. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4 describes this so well. But beyond that, God works in and through us. Did you hear that? God works in and through us toward an ultimate good that serves his purpose. Once again, his purpose, not our purpose. The comfort of the verse is that nothing in this life, and I mean nothing in this life of waiting and suffering is wasted. It is all meaningful 
for those in Christ. Even if it means that we still have pain in that moment. Remember I described last week what happened to Pastor Terry? It's still amazing. I will repeat a tiny bit of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, got to have a quick drink. Oh, that is so good. See, God works in amazing ways. We stopped off at Timmy's, wanted to get a coffee. I go in there, I tap my points card, and it's free. God is great. Oh, a free coffee, a free mocha. I love it. Good morning, Christina. Now, I know I mentioned it last week, but this also, there'll be different people watching this week, right, that are watching online. And by the way, welcome, Pastor Terry. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. When he, because we went to dinner at their house to celebrate their anniversary. So congratulations, once again, Aldania and Pastor Terry on their anniversary. So he was telling me what happened as he was trying to leave Africa. Don't need to tell Ireland, he knows all about it. Right, Ireland? There was a possibility that he could not leave Africa because of his pains, right? Now, this is where you're going to say, well, what has this got to do with Romans 8, 28? It's got everything to do with it. All things work, all things. Pastor Terry spoke to them and said, no, I can make the flight. I'm okay. If they have stopped him, he'd still be in Africa. He gets to the next flight. The same problem happened again, right, Ireland? He had to prove that he could still make the next flight even with his pains and suffering. Once again, if he, they would have stopped him, he would still be in Africa. Then he took his third flight, which is the main one coming to Canada. If he hadn't have taken that flight, he would have been stuck in Africa. And what would have happened if he was stuck in Africa? Would he have still been here? Because his insurance expired. He had no insurance. And the hospital that it was in has limited, they don't have the best doctors, especially for cardiac. So there's a very high chance Pastor Terry, if it has been stuck in Africa, would not have been here today. He would have been in a place where we could only imagine right now. But because of Romans 8.28, that all things work for good, God arranged it that he made each one of those flights. And it wasn't until he arrived in the airport in Toronto that his pain in his chest started. He was back in Canada, back in Ontario, and he was very close to the hospital that specializes in problems that he's having with his heart. Does anybody think this might be by accident, or was this part of God's plan? So Romans 8.28 works everywhere. He's with us. He's getting better. When we saw him yesterday, he's got great color in his face. He's a bit weak, which we will continue to pray. Don't say, yeah, I'll pray for him and don't pray. When you promise to pray, you pray. From here, not here. God works through our pain and suffering. Because of what Pastor Terry was in the hospital. The number of comments that he got from nurses and stuff about, wow. What was it one comment Pastor Terry said? They looked at him and said, oh, he must be praying. He got the reputation in the hospital. <coughs> they knew who he is. They knew he was a pastor. And they saw him praying and trying to spread the gospel even though he could die. Now, this is where Romans 8.28 comes into power. He used Pastor Terry's weakness, blood clots, pain in his shoulder, on medication that he could hardly think and hardly speak. But God used him to send a message to others that even through this pain, I can do God's work. Remember what I said? A short, you missed it, by the way, Christiana. I was talking about it a little bit earlier, how in life we love God, but we complain. We complain about our pain. We complain about everything. I've had people, when I've uh, 
So, for example, my wife had mentioned to someone at the store about the suffering that I was going through because I don't really tell people. And what did they say to you, dear? Did they not say something about he doesn't show it? See? Because we find our strength. Philippians 4.13. I can do some things. Is it some things? Oh, all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. Live by that verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We get our strength from above, not from inside. Our physical health fails. We, there's days we don't want to get out of bed. Almost every morning. Oops, I said that too loud. <laughs> there are days that we don't want to do anything. Often. I'm being too honest. But when we call upon him, he will be faithful and loyal to give us strength. That's right. Not on our own doing. Not on our own doing. Right? So therefore, when you're suffering, any of us, right, Elizabeth? Let us remember not to think about what we are going through, but how we can use it for his glory. Make people realize, for example, we know that it's tragic that we lose someone so young. But God used that to bring people together that don't even talk to each other anymore. See how it works? The tragedy turns something into something amazing. That is how I met my wife. Through something terrible that happened. But God had plans. And 13 years later, we've been married 13 years now because of what God arranged back then. Someone died to change lives in the future. This is how God uses everything. Not some things, but all things. We just have to trust and believe. Amen? So as I come to the end of this message, let us please understand that for those who are believers and are suffering with sickness, with illness or disease, or whatever it is in your life, the knowledge that we can glorify God through our suffering tempers the uncertainty as to why he has allowed it. Something we may not truly understand until the day that we stand in his presence. And here's something. We have questions, right? We have many questions about what God does. So, can I ask any of you, when we're standing in front of the presence and we're in front of God, and we're in front of our Lord Jesus, we have questions for him, right? What kind of questions do you think you'll ask? I'm just curious. Can anyone name a question? You see Jesus face to face. What are you going to ask him? Why are you allowed suffering? Good question. Same thing? Well, here is something that is going to remove your socks from your feet. It's a literal saying. When we are in front of our Lord Jesus, and he looks at us as, well done, you're my good and faithful servant, and we make it past the book of life, and then works, and we stand in front of him, I've got news for you. Sorry, we won't be asking any questions. Do you know why? We won't need to. We have all the answers. We didn't think of that, did we? What we suffered here in this world, what we suffered in this life, doesn't mean a thing. Because we will be in the glory of God. We will be in our new resurrected bodies where we won't have the negative questions. We will have the answers. So which one do you want? Do you want to ask the questions or are you looking forward to having the answers? Amen. Because we will no longer live for the cares of this world, but we will live in eternity with a loving, understanding, caring God. Please remember that, okay? In your pain, if you are suffering pain, 
and you hear someone say, thank you, God, for my pain. And you look at them and say, this guy will. Remember, when you're feeling that pain, you're still alive. Amen? Lelaine told me off the other day. She said, remember, he won't give you more than you can manage. Thank you, dear. I needed that reminder. Because sometimes we get overwhelmed, right? We get overwhelmed and we say, okay, enough. Was it enough for Job? Look what Job lost. His brothers, his sisters, his, he lost everything. He lost all his, all his wealth. Even his wife said, oh, just curse God and die. Did Job curse God and die? We should not curse God and die. We blame God. Let us stop blaming the one who loves us. Let us stop blaming the one who gives us life. It may not be a perfect life. You might think it may not be a good life, but it is still a life that God gave us. And you're never alone, please. When you accept Jesus Christ, you're never alone. I'm crowded. We're all crowded. There's me, there's God, there's Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we're never alone. I've heard so many say, I feel so alone. Well, why don't you do me a favor? Talk to the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you know what's going to be strange? He'll answer you. Whoa. And it doesn't mean you're schizophrenic. No, it means that God loves you. But he's waiting for us to listen. So I'm going to close now. But I'm just going to say, how many of us pray and get busy? Is it true? We pray a beautiful prayer. Amen. Oh, oh, new status. We get busy with the world. This is just distraction. Right? Oh, I'm going to go on my cell phone and look up the Bible. I thought this was the Bible. The electronic version is corrupted. It has false teaching in there as well. There are words that are changed to change the meaning. Go to the real book. Go to the real source of every answer. You will no longer need to ask God for the answers because he's given us the answers. The more you love God, the more you open this. You know what I want to see? Look at this, look, look. See all these markings in there? You know what? My Bible's in mint condition compared to Pastor Terry's. His Bible is falling to pieces. If our Bible is falling to pieces, you have the greatest Bible in the world. Do you know why? It's because you're using it. Let us use what's in here and don't print it up on the wall and say, look, I got a Bible, isn't that nice? <laughs> Blow the dust off. Use the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and live the Word of God. Amen? Beautiful. Beautiful. So now, do we understand a little bit more why God allows sickness? Do we understand a bit more? So let God use that sickness through you as a strength to show others. When they say, how can you continue to do what you're doing? Why? Because I have a loving God. Then we can actually give an account. Amen? So let us close in a word of prayer, please. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word, your living word, not just words in a book, but the living word that you gave us. You gave us every single answer for every single problem. And Lord, may we learn to give glory to the sickness and the pain and the suffering that we have. Because this pain and suffering, Lord, is nothing compared to what Jesus went through for us. So please, Lord, wake us up and make us realize how to use this pain for your glory. Thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done for us and what you continue to do in each one of us. We thank you. We pray in the name of our living Lord, our living God, our living Holy Spirit. Amen. So, until the next time we meet again, may the Lord shine his face upon you. May he guide you. May he protect you. May people see Jesus in you. And when we leave here, that it is not amen, 
but it is just the beginning of our lessons to further God's kingdom here on earth. We pray in the name of Jesus, our living Savior. Amen. Have a wonderful week. See you all again next week. God bless you all.